It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you to make better financial decisions in your life. In this episode, I'm excited to talk about how my favorite convenience stores are all on a growth tear and why this is so helpful to your wallet. So I know it's crazy. I find convenience stores exciting, but eh, what can I tell you? Now, something I don't find exciting is the price of lots of foods that are going up, up, and away. I'm going to tell you what's getting more expensive and actually what's not. So the big run-up in gasoline gets people more focused on breaking habits and thinking about, where am I buying my gasoline? Why am I buying it there? And I know the prices in a lot of places have come down some. People get more focused on it when they're going up, and then they kind of get used to the prices when they kind of level off or go down a little. But it's still a lot of money we're paying. And I talked about four weeks ago about how the gasoline market has gone through such an enormous change. And what's been happening is the market is state after state after state, the market is being dominated by independent retailers, not the traditional oil companies. Traditional oil companies are hideous operators of retail gas stations. They're pitiful at it. And the volume of sales of gas all going to these big, mostly regional players, uh, Quick Trip that's based in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that's in Arizona, Iowa, Georgia, Missouri, I'm trying to think, Kansas, what other states they're in. And so they come to dominate local markets because they offer uh, what's generally a safe place for the big thing these independents have it's a safe environment for a woman generally to go fill up her vehicle. Um, they offer uh, combinations of food in their places, fresh food, not just day-old pizza sitting on some warmer. And they're innovators. I think about uh, what's probably the fastest growing of these independents, Wawa, which people who are from the mid-Atlantic states are very familiar with Wawa, W-A-W-A. And these companies like Wawa and Quick Trip and the others like them, what they do is they offer, uh, Sheets is another one, they offer really good prices on gasoline. They offer some ability for you to get a meal on the go that's like actually hot and just made. And... They offer decent prices on things they sell inside in what's generally a safer environment. So Wawa is booming. They're going to double the number of stores they have up and down the East Coast. They're now huge in the state of Florida. They're another one that is all really I-95 oriented, you know, radiating out from Interstate 95 that runs along the eastern seaboard. And it is a completely different kind of experience going to these kind of places from a traditional gas retailer. You save money and you have a better experience. But Wawa is doing something particularly of note. They are installing electric vehicle chargers at a huge number of their locations. And it's turning out to be an incredibly profitable business move on their part because what's the difference between somebody who goes in to buy gas and somebody who charges an electric vehicle? Somebody who goes in to charge an electric vehicle will be at the charging point 10 to 30 minutes. Somebody who goes in to buy gasoline is there 5 to 10 minutes. So what do people do with the 10 to 30 minutes? They go inside and they spend money. It's an incredible win for the convenience store that figures this out. And you don't want to end up in something that over time is absolutely going to be a shrinking market. And that is the sale of gasoline. 
Not going to happen at once, but there's going to be a gradual decline in the amount of gallons sold. So your customers decide that they're going to go from driving an electric to drive, driving a gas engine vehicle to an electric. You follow your customers. You go where they're going rather than saying, gosh, what happened to all those people who used to come in and buy gasoline? You adapt with the times. And that's one of the things that these independent operators have. And Krista, having traveled with me uh, over the years, book tours and all the rest, used to laugh at me so hard when we'd be somewhere in the country and we'd go to one of these independent, uh, well-run convenience store chains, and I would be talking about what? You get so excited about just every aspect of the stores. What, and whenever, kind, of, what kind of flooring they oh, use? Oh, everything, yeah. All how the, you order the food. The machines, the lighting, the reason they did it that way. And whenever we see a Wawa, you still, you go, Wawa! <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It made I, it interesting to me. So, and Which is hard to do with the you know with convenience stores. And most people don't think about it much, but you, you make it interesting. Okay, something never to forget about me. If you've not heard me say it, just remember this. I make the mundane exciting and the exciting mundane. <laughs> it's just part of my unusual personality. All right, we'll get to some questions for you. This one's from uh, Yush in Connecticut. My parents had booked a flight that was canceled from the departure airport due to bad weather. They booked an afternoon. Do they say what airline? Southwest. Okay. They booked an airline, an afternoon flight, not the last flight of the day, but the airline moved them to a flight one entire day later. They spoke to customer service in person and over the phone, but the airline refuses to provide any compensation for accommodations or food as the flight was canceled due to bad weather. What are the options that they have in this case? So, Yush, this is a real problem that the nation's airlines are no longer required when they have a cancellation to buy you travel on any other airline. It used to be called Rule 240. Uh, and we should have that because right now what's happening is the passenger is the one who, the customer, who ends up being inconvenienced, loses part of a vacation, misses a wedding, whatever it is, and has expense with having to overnight or whatever. So there was a safety reason why the feds give airlines pretty much unlimited leeway to say, oh, this was because of a mechanical, this was because of weather. And it could be, could not be, whatever. But they don't require an airline to provide compensation in those circumstances because they never want an airline to be tempted to fly a plane when crew is past hours or they fly a plane that's what's called pencil whipped. If you're not familiar, an uh, aviation mechanic could explain to you pencil whipping. That's when they write that something's okay when it's really not, so the plane flies. And so it's all to remove any economic incentive that any airline would have to cut corners on safety. But I think the real solution to this is for Congress to reinstitute Rule 240 and require that, in this case Southwest, have to go buy you seats on whoever else had a flight that could have gotten them to their destination the same day. Over time, unless an airline really runs an abysmal operation, everybody would end up with the same net cost with the airlines because, you know, if American had a flight cancel and they bought tickets for you on United or uh, Delta had a flight cancel and bought you tickets on Southwest or whoever it is, that it would take the passenger out of the equation of having our lives disrupted because of whatever happened in an airline. But my big beef with the situation, Yush, that you brought forward is that so often the airlines blame weather for something that has nothing to do with weather just so they don't have to pay compensation. And to leave people stranded high and dry, in my book, just is not okay. This is from Stephanie in Wisconsin. Hi, Clark. I love the podcast, your advice, and the content from your team. 
A number of businesses in my area, like restaurants, car service centers, golf courses, are starting to charge 3.99% fees if you want to use a credit card. Should I be using my debit card in these instances to avoid these fees? I typically don't carry a lot of cash, but maybe I need to start doing so. I'm looking for your sage advice on how to combat these fees. Yeah, so what's happening is Visa and MasterCard recently changed their formulas for what you pay as a, as a merchant or a restaurant or whoever accepting credit cards. And so it's become backbreaking for a lot of businesses that aren't the size of like Amazon or Walmart or somebody like that or Target who are big enough that they are able to negotiate from a real position of strength with Visa and MasterCard. Everybody else pretty much is left to the whims of the marketplace and the Visa and MasterCard cartel. And so they end up with these massive fees. So I support uh, retailers and restaurants doing this, unbundling and saying, yeah, if you want to use a credit card, uh, it costs us this much. We're going to charge you this 4% fee or 2% or 3% fee. And then I get to make a choice of paying with cash or a debit card or whatever so that the fee is not charged to the merchant because I didn't use that credit card and I save money shopping there essentially. So I think that is a reasonable decision that retailers and restaurants are making and you're thinking just like the free market should have you think, okay, I'm not going to pay the 4%. I'm going to use my debit card and avoid it. I like that. Do you? So you wouldn't rather cash than a debit card because of the issues with the debit Oh, well, cards? I would rather somebody use cash, but given this circumstance, remember what I always say about debit cards? Debit cards don't come with the protection of a credit card, which means if the number's compromised, you got real hassles. But that is a possibility where in this case, I know I'm going to save 4%. It's kind of like how I've explained the Target red card. Yes. It's a debit card that you know you're going to save 5% every time you shop, but there's a possibility your account could get compromised. And I guess in this case, you're using it as a true debit and you're putting your PIN in, so maybe that's a little more protection. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. I should have mentioned that. Okay, so what's this about? So Congress forever ago passed something called the CARD Act, and what it does is it tightly controls the fees that can be charged for using a debit card, but doesn't do that for credit cards. So that's why a merchant can take a debit with PIN and not cost them any real money, relatively speaking, where accepting that credit card or somebody who uses a debit card but clears it as a credit card, the fees are huge for the merchant. And so using a debit card with PIN saves the merchant a lot of money. And if they were doing what these people are doing where they're saying, you know, it'll save you money too if you do it, then you're making a marketplace decision. Okay, Leah in Kentucky wrote in and said, I have a friend who bought a used Prius, and the first thing he did was take the expensive catalytic converter off and sell it for $1,000, and then replaced it with an aftermarket one for 50 bucks. It works fine <laughs> and doesn't have the expensive metals in it. He not only put the money into his own pocket instead of the thieves, it will keep him from getting his stolen in the future. Thieves know the difference right away. So this is a post that's very interesting. I'm not smart enough to know how you would replace a catalytic converter with an aftermarket or any of that. This came up because people are, uh, are having their catalytic converters stolen because they're worth so much to a chop shop that sells to places that look the other way and they buy it to put on a vehicle that they can buy the catalytic converter the stolen one at so much lower a price. And so the theft problem is huge, particularly in states where you have emission testing and they right away know, hey, your catalytic converter is gone, you failed emission, and then you have a very expensive repair. So your friend proactively took away the incentive for the criminal and knew how to replace it with an aftermarket that was cheap. And that's way beyond my level of knowledge, but very impressive. Straight ahead, we're all getting walloped at the supermarket. And I want to talk about what you can do about it. 
Grocery prices continue to really eat into people's wallets. Oh, that was a terrible pun. I didn't mean to say. I'm sorry. And we have a new briefing at Clark.com. What items have gone up the most just since January? And uncooked poultry, not including chicken, but including turkey, up over 4%. Canned fruits, up roughly 4%. Um, Dairy products, up about 2.5%. Ground beef, up 2.5%. Fresh fish, up about that same amount. I mean, we're talking about significant increases in prices. What was not on that list? Interestingly enough, a lot of healthier items are not rising at the same rates as other items. Uh, Produce, most fruits and vegetables. See, when I mentioned fruits, it was um, canned fruits, but fresh fruit. Fresh vegetables are so subject to the whims of what's available at that time that their prices have not been doing a straight trend line up. And how you shop matters so much. You know, when you buy what you buy. So I wait to buy something that I know is a regular household staple until it's on sale. Period. I mean, we can substitute what we eat based on what's going on with prices in the marketplace. And we do that in our household all the time. Where we shop matters so much. Now, my wife, if Trader Joe's was a person, she would dump me and marry Trader Joe's. She loves that store. And... She says she can be in a bad mood or be down, and she goes to Trader Joe's, and her mood just improves being in the store. Christy, you're nodding your head, too? Oh, yeah. I feel the same way. I love Trader Joe's. I love it. And the funny thing about... And his Italian brand, Trader Giatto's. (laughs) (laughs) The funny thing about Trader Joe's is, or TJ's as the people who love it call it, is that the prices are really good there, too. I mean, where you shop does matter. The supermarket industry in much of the country tends to have two regional players in each part of the country that are traditional grocers, and they are high lows. And I explained high lows before that they sell most of what they sell in the store at pretty high markups. But what they lure you in with are the lows, the items that they put on sale that week. And so they know that there are people that will be cherry pickers, certain number of people that will come in and will only buy the items that are on promotional at a high-low supermarket, but that most people will come in, lured in, buy the sale items, and they'll buy those, but then they'll fill out their basket with the items that have the really high markups. An alternative to that is to buy groceries at Walmart. A lot of people have been very unhappy, particularly with the fresh produce, the fruits and vegetables at Walmart stores. But their regular pricing is at a much lower markup than it is at the typically two regional, traditional supermarkets in an area. And then my favorite is Trader Joe's corporate sibling, Aldi. And... I was just at Aldi yesterday (laughs) buying groceries. And yes, their prices are higher too than they were before we got into this inflationary cycle. But the overall cost of a basket is so much cheaper at Aldi. And I know there are people who eye roll at the mention of Aldi because they hate it. They hate the experience. They hate the store brand thing. They hate that you have to bag your own groceries. They hate that you have to pay a quarter deposit to have a shopping cart. Um, But I'll tell you what doesn't happen in an Aldi parking lot. Cars don't get dented by shopping carts that people abandon in the lot. Because Aldi shoppers are so cheap, they're not leaving without getting their quarter back. And the only way you get your quarter back is you return the cart in, you click it in, your quarter pops out. 
So, yes, there are things right now that feel out of control. There are things that feel like we can't do anything about them. And we cannot control that prices are going up. But we can control how we spend that money. And while we're on this topic, I want to mention one other thing. There are a lot of people that are really suffering from food prices. People at the lower end of the income scale are much more affected by grocery prices than the average American family. Even though we don't like it when we go in, the reality is in the United States, even with these higher prices, we spend an amazingly low percent of every dollar we earn on groceries, just about the lowest amount as a percent of income of any developed country. But people at the lower end of the income scale are getting squeezed beyond measure by where grocery prices are right now. And that's why I'm really excited about all these libertarian-minded efforts where people just put together these community pantries. There's no government involvement. There's no big bureaucracy. People just do it. We have one near us which has actual refrigerators where you can go take things that would be perishable and you just donate them right into the refrigerator. It's completely an honor system. The people who come and get food from these uh, refrigerated pantries where non-refrigerated items go next to them in like these very simple wooden crates and then you've got the refrigerated items in the refrigerator and people helping people out with basically virtually no overhead and so this is a time that people who are not carrying a lot of income on their balance sheet need our help and community groups churches religious organizations of all types really can make a difference i know there are those among us who say oh well the government will take care of that better we take care of it we are the government we forget that so often in a in a modern society we forget that government is just a collection of us as people and but there's a cost involved there's tax overhead all the rest and that's why solutions we can do locally where we provide the help where clearly it's needed are things that are very important to me where you and I choose of our own initiative to make a difference. Krista? Okay, let's go to some questions. This is from Josh in Minnesota. My wife and I are going to be putting our house on the market in the next couple of months and we're in our late 20s. We stand to make between $80,000 and $100,000 from the sale. We That's make, great. I know. We make $120,000 a year combined. My wife is pregnant. Congratulations. Congratulations. And we are looking to move closer to family in the Minneapolis metro. We would be looking to spend between three hundred seventy-five to 425000 Rent in our area would be between 1800 and $2,200. We have 34000 in student loan debt and 18000 in a car. We are wondering if it would make sense for us to sell and buy another house or would it make more sense for us to rent a couple of years until the market calms down? We would use the money from the sale of the home to pay off debt and save for a future home. Okay, so that's a lot to absorb. Mm -hmm. um, so, Josh, what I want you looking at in the Minneapolis Metro, you said that rent would be between 1800 and 2200 a month. So just use the mortgage calculator. See what it would cost you for that home that you're interested in between 375 and 425 uh, 425000 what the monthly carry on that mortgage would be. You've got taxes and insurance. There are a very large number of markets in the United States that even with today's inflated home prices, it makes more sense to buy and carry that mortgage instead of rent. So if you were to calculate what that mortgage would be per month, if it is equivalent to the cost of renting, then in addition to that, you got taxes and insurance, maintenance. You're still better off buying for an ownership cycle than you are to rent. Because 
if you were looking at a market where rents were substantially cheaper than what the effective monthly cost of a house is, mortgage and expenses involved, then you rent. But that's not really the case with the numbers you presented. You're probably going to find that if you're going to be in a meaningful ownership cycle, which means minimum of seven years, Josh, for this house, you're probably better off in the prevailing price points you're talking about buying instead of renting. And this question is from Anaris in Kentucky. I'm 34 years old and currently contributing $600 a month to a brokerage account. My advisor is splitting it in half cash, half large cap purchases. I'm already contributing 5% into my Roth 401k and getting a 5% employer match. Should I keep that six hundred dollars all cash with no investments in my or am I invest and am I investing too much? At thirty four years old, I don't understand at all why your advisor is putting you fifty percent in cash and what you're putting in every month. I would have to ask specifically, is that money for a short term need? Is it like in the prior question, are you trying to build up a big reserve? for a down payment on a house? Or is there some other kind of expense that is a short-term expense that you're saving for? If the answer to that is no, then putting half of your money every month into cash seems to be way, way, way too tentative and conservative at 34 years old. If this is money you're putting aside for long term, I would much rather you and be investing that money, knowing that, yes, in the short term, you could see some losses, but you don't want to miss the long-term growth that happens with investing. Also have a question I want you to check on. What are you paying in expenses with the brokerage you're with? The brokerage you're with is not a low-cost brokerage, and I want you also to see if your advisor who's recommending the split if he or she is operating legally as a fiduciary, meaning that what they're doing is in your best interest. Um, the 5% of your pay into a Roth 401k, you're obviously somebody who's really good at saving money. I'd like you to increase the amount you're contributing into your Roth 401k to 10% of your pay. Pick up that employer match because over the long haul, that's going to be the money I'm going to want you to build up tax-free, the portion you're contributing. The employer money will be ultimately taxed when you use it later. But I want you to build up more money ultimately for retirement than you are right now at putting 5% of your pay in. And this is from Jeff in Georgia. We have a 30-year-old son with autism. He needs a prepaid card to be able to access some services when we are not with him. What is the best card you've seen that we could use that would allow us to add funds for him? He is pretty level-headed with expenditures, so we are not worried about a spending spree. We just want to be sure he can access restaurants and transportation when they are cashless. So the answer historically I've given is Bluebird, which you is a cooperative effort of American Express and Walmart. And the Bluebird account works very well. We get virtually zero complaints about it. It doesn't fee you to death. And it is a card that is a hybrid that you can do everything with it, loading money and all that online. Or you can do it in person through a Walmart money center, easier to do online. But it is my favorite for a situation like the one you're describing. And Bluebird is an unusual product for American Express. I've never expected them to stay with it so far. They have, and it still seems to be the legit, straight, clean deal. And I want to tell you, if we didn't get to your question or you want advice, you can reach our Team Clark Consumer Action Center Monday through Friday from 10 in the morning Eastern Time till 4 in the afternoon Eastern Time. Our services are free. We've been offering free one-on-one -on -one advice for almost 30 years now. I'm really, really proud of the advice we're able to offer, one-on-one -on -one advice that you can trust. The phone number, 
four nine Clark.